Hello, and I am back. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, the next kind of segment of post-labor economics. It's what I call the economic agency paradox. So uh, <laughs> without bearing the lead, here's the formula. It's very simple. A plus B equals C. So A is better, faster, cheaper, and safer. This is what I've been talking about for a couple years now. But for anyone who's new, it's basically that as AI and robotics become superior to humans in both cognitive and physical domains, the economic implications are inescapable. Machines will simply outperform humans at virtually every task, making automation the only economically rational choice. It isn't really a choice, it's mathematical inevitability. So TLDR, when machines become better, faster, cheaper, and safer than humans, it becomes economically inevitable that they will replace human labor. This has happened many times throughout history. This is why humans have delegated to machines in terms of tractors or computers. We actually invented computers because we suck at math. Um, so again, but as the frontier of automation continues to expand, then it just it takes more and more uh, jobs from us. So then this leads to the economic agency paradox. So I've talked about economic agency for a while. But this is kind of a new component of this, which is looking at the demand side, which is as productivity goes up, wages go down, and consumer demand dries up. So therefore, the economy stalls. So this creates a critical paradox. While automation promises unpre unprecedented productive efficiency, it simultaneously threatens to eliminate human labor income. Without, weighted, weigh, bleh, without wages, there we go, where does, humor, where does consumer purchasing power come from? Traditional solutions like UBI provide basic subsistence, but fail to address the fundamental need for genuine economic participation. In other words, UBI is basically like just getting an, an allowance from your parents. And that's not good. I mean, it's, it's a start, you know, it's better than nothing, but that is no way to live. Um, and there's all sorts of other problems with that. So yes, I'm all for UBI um, as a way of bootstrapping this new system. So therefore, so that's A plus B. So better, faster, cheaper, and safer leads to the economic agency paradox. Therefore, we need some alternative. So to provide a little bit of context, I thought through of like, okay, well, you could have all these like robot taxes and mandated participation um, and those sorts of things, but those create market inefficiencies and they're like very top down, um, inelegant solutions, uh, which basically distorts the market and requires a lot of government intervention and oversight, and therefore it's going to be inefficient. So I thought, I was thinking, what's the most efficient solution? And so the most market efficient solution is an investment based future. So the solution emerges by transforming everyone from laborers to investors. We already have a mental model for investors. So if, if nobody's going to be working, what if we all become investors? Um, so if we all become investors in the uh, automated economy, through AI-assisted investing and universal asset tokenization, people maintain economic agency by directing resources rather than providing labor. Instead of trying to preserve human jobs in an economy that no longer needs them, we need a new form of economic participation. So... Uh, and you might say, well, where do you get the money to start with that? And we'll cover all of that. Um, but here are the core principles. So the, the seven core principles for adopting this. Um, so number one is universal asset tokenization. Uh, basically, if, if something is not tokenized, it should be. Um, this is an extension of neoliberalism where it says anything outside of the market should be brought into the market. Um, and we can extend that with cryptocurrency, blockchain, DAOs, and all that other fun stuff. Um, basically one way to look at it is there are 8,000 companies on the New York stock exchange, but there are millions of other companies and other, um, monetizable assets that are not. Now, one thing that, uh, someone pointed out to me is that we need to be careful with this because this will, uh, this could magnify the tragedy of the commons. So imagine you have a forest that you tokenize and then people just buy off all the trees and say, well, I bought this tree, so now I'm going to cut it down. Uh, and so by monetizing everything, you could actually drastically magnify the problems that we have today. But this is where responsible consensus-based governance will actually uh, be a major component. Um, basically, instead of the AI saying, we're going to just selfishly cut everything down, we're going to find a more efficient way and sustainable way of, of managing these resources. Um, still, the incentive structure is there. Number two, AI enhanced market agency. This is basically what a lot of people are already working on, which is all the um, all the the ground infrastructure to enable AIs to do stuff on our behalf. So this is all the experiments with AI agents and and decentralized autonomous organizations, and so on and so forth. So this this technology is already coming, really. Um, decentralized infrastructure. 
This is uh, the open protocols for agent-to-agent -agent communication. Um, so instead of, you know, we have B2B um, and B2C, so that's business-to-business -business and business-to-customer. We're soon going to have A-to-A -A transactions, which is agent-to-agent -agent, uh, transactions. So we need open protocols for that. I actually know some people that are working on this. We also need blockchain networks that can allow all of this to happen. Um, and one of the reasons that you want it on blockchain uh, some of it, not all of it. You do need some level of privacy, but you want a lot of the stuff out in the open just so that you can automatically see who you can trust, who actually delivers on the goods and so on and so forth. Um, just in the same way that in any open marketplace, you can see the transactions happening. Uh, legal framework mo modernization. So this one is actually really critical because the federal government right now is very hostile to what they, they would... Basically, if you were to, in, to build this right now, they would call it a securities exchange and sue you out of existence. And so since the federal government is not particularly supportive of these things, um, the federal government needs to get out of the way and become supportive of these things. Um, you know, we look at examples uh, like Sam Bankman fried had the book thrown at him. He deserved it. But at the same time, it also had a chilling effect because there's no legal pathway forward right now for uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain and that sort of thing. Um, Part of the reason that there's no legal pathway forward right now is because these technologies are not mature enough. And you might say, well, they've been around for a while, but look at the fact that the internet was around for about 30 years before it really became commercially viable. Blockchain is only about 15 years old, uh, at least Bitcoin as we know it today. The roots of blockchain go back to the 90s. Um, so anyways, my point though is that these technologies are not quite mature yet. They're not, they're not stable enough um, to really be used to replace existing infrastructure. Number five is radical market transparency. So this is basically if there's information outside of the market, information should be brought into the market. And this, again, is just so that everyone can make better choices. This is not in intellectual property. Market information is different from intellectual property. Um, but at the same time, um, waiting for quarterly reports is way too slow. We need you know hourly, daily, real-time reports that are machine-readable to make decisions um, to make rational, informed decisions, because as pretty much everyone agrees, more information leads to better market choices. So, okay, cool. Maximize market transparency. And by the way, blockchain is intrinsically transparent. This is why I say we really need open protocols in blockchain to enable this, uh, this decision, because then you just have an, an AI agent running on your phone or on the cloud, and you say, hey, go find me some solar farms to invest in. And it has access to all the information it needs in real time without the gatekeeping of terminals and that sort of thing. Uh, number six, this is pretty boilerplate, but it's still necessary, which is democratic access, uh, making sure that everyone has practical ability to participate through education, technology, and initial capital. This is where UBI comes in. Um, if UBI becomes necessary, then it's like, okay, everyone has a subsistence wage coming from the government, but now you actually have, you have to have opportunities to invest it. The simplest access would be through your bank. So let's say, you know, you have a bank account, you get $2,000 a month from the government. You could tell your bank, hey, just automatically invest 10% of that for me. I don't want to think about it. And then the bank's AIs will go and invest it for you based on your risk profile. Cool. Now, if you want to be more active, you can either, you know, have your bank app and, and help your AI agent find investments for you um, or use a third-party service or whatever. I don't really care. Um, but that's, that's, again, that's what democratic access means, is giving people investment options as well as ways to make it automatic and transparent. So, again, while it is an investment-based future, it's not necessarily that, like, your, your work is going to be finding good investments. So that's what everyone's new investment is going to mean. You might say, well, how does that run the economy? It's because you're decentralizing value creation. Um, and then finally, value capture protection, design systems. Uh, and I would, I would, I, I had an oversight. I would say design systems and implement policies that direct value to legitimate stakeholders rather than extractive intermediaries. This is going to be particularly uh, important as there's going to be plenty of rent seekers. Basically, people saying, "Oh, just give your money to me," like uh, crypto hedge funds. Basically, give your money to me, and I'll invest it for you. No, get the hedge funds out of the way and let the AI invest directly. Um, now, you might, you might have legitimate vehicles of, for de-risking. So, for instance, um, you might have investment trusts that say, okay, we will allocate more broadly in a way that you couldn't do on your own, and it's insured, and yada, yada, yada. But that's rent-seeking. And one of the most basic uh, kinds of rent-seeking that we see today is uh, the credit card companies, um, transaction fees. So every time you swipe a, a credit card or a debit card, 
the company, the 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 like Visa or Mastercard or whatever, they they skim two to three percent off the top. That's an additional two to three percent tax that you're paying for the privilege of being able to use your money. Um, if we switch to blockchain and cryptocurrency, that drops to 0.1 percent. So that's an additional two to three percent that goes directly back to GDP and is directly usable to everyone. So we need to get those old systems out of the picture. Okay, so the whole generation, so that, that's, that's the whole theory in a nutshell. Now let me walk you through how I got to all of this. So first, a lot of people talk about post-scarcity economics, and post-scarcity just really doesn't fit the bill. So post-scarcity by definition is after we've solved all constraints and there is no longer any scarcity. However, if you, leave, if you read some real economy, uh, economics, then this is not really the way that it works. There's always constraints. There's always some scarcity. And the example that I give is Malibu beachfront property. Why do you think uh, you know Santa Monica is so expensive? It's because it's desirable real estate, and so then you end up with ordinal and price competition and blah, 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 blah. You get it. So, um, and another example that I give is horses versus cars. Horses are relatively cheap and easy to make, but cars are just so much better that it's worth the extra cost to build a car than it is to just grow another horse. Horses require a lot of care and maintenance and upkeep. They get sick. Um, they need a lot of, uh, I mean, cars need maintenance too, but in terms of miles per maintenance, cars are much cheaper. So, uh, so post-scarcity just doesn't work. There's always going to be some constraint. Um, hyperabundance, well, we can think of some hyperabundance. So air, wind, water in some places, gravity. Uh, basically, the, the rule for hyperabundance is a resource that is too cheap to meter. Um, and yes, some things are going to become hyperabundant. Cognitive labor is going to become hyperabundant. So cognitive labor is everything from law, medicine, um, even, even uh, things that I do, all the thinking that I do. Um, because guess what? A lot of this wouldn't work without the aid of tools like Claude and ChatGPT. So they're already doing about half of the cognitive labor that goes into this. Now, I wrote all this by hand. Um, but a lot of the brainstorming happened with the help of AI, so it's not going to be too long, excuse me, before AI is able to just take this over from me. Um, so hyperabundance, that's not really the goal because wood is still going to grow slowly. There's still going to be, you know, limited real estate. Some resources, namely intelligence, are going to become hyperabundant, but that's not really a solution for the rest of it. So... Then I looked back at history and I said, okay, well, what have the previous industrial revolutions um, have done? So the first industrial revolution was basically the steampunk revolution, um, where mechanical devices and steam and coal became, uh, you know, economically relevant. So we had access to a new uh, source of energy. So uh, previous uh, industrial revolutions were somewhat largely about the ability to exploit new energy sources. So the first industrial revolution was how do we harness coal? The second industrial revolution was how do we harness petroleum? But that didn't that paradigm didn't really stand up because the third industrial revolution was more about data and information. Um, yes, we invented nuclear energy, um, but that that was not necessarily considered part of the third industrial revolution. That was an evolution of the in, uh, energy infrastructure. Um, so, and then you end up during the second industrial revolution was actually pretty awful. Um, in terms of uh, human costs. So first industrial revolution, steampunk. Uh, second industrial revolution is diesel punk. This is what allows you to have industrial scale wars. World War I and World War II were direct consequences of the second industrial revolution, as well as all the tenement housing and you know dismembered children working in factories. Um, so the second industrial revolution was far and away the most destructive um, in terms of social cost and, and cost of human life. So, you know, when you think like, oh, well, another industrial revolution, that's not necessarily a good thing, I would tend to agree with you because of the second industrial revolution. Um, the third industrial revolution is more like the cyberpunk revolution. So this is everything from silicon to internet to data and, you know, all those other things. So if we characterize each industrial revolution and with a, with a moniker like steampunk or dieselpunk or cyberpunk, then that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so the fourth industrial revolution, we might end up with a more cyberpunk future. Um, so then I was like, okay, well, looking at how labor evolved. 
So labor evolved. Where did I go? Okay, so we started with agrarian to industrial to service-based. So now instead we'll go ag ag agrarian, industrial, service, investment-based. So the economy of the future is an investment-based economy where you use the monetary resources that you have access to and control over to direct you know, or invest in other people to find other economically productive things to do, which keeps the economy going because then you get a return on investment, which shores up your consumer demand. All right, following along, great. So after all that, I came up with a pretty solid definition of post-labor economics. I keep redefining this, this thing, by the way, just as I get these new insights. So let me just read this because this is one of the, the densest definitions of post-labor economics. So post-labor economics decide, uh, describes, sorry, a fundamental transformation of, in, of economic systems in which artificial intelligence and automation render human level labor costs effectively ne negligible. So basically labor trends toward zero um, across all sectors of the economy. In this paradigm, machine capabilities exceed human capabilities by orders of magnitude in both cognitive and physical domains, creating cost differentials where automated solutions are thousands of times more cost effective than human labor. This represents not merely an incremental improvement in productivity, but a categorical shift where human labor becomes economically irrational due to the vast efficiency gap. This transformation represents a complete decoupling, hence the name of the book that I'm working on with Julia, The Great Decoupling, uh, represents a complete decoupling of economic growth from human labor participation. Capital fully subsumes labor as a factor of production, requiring a fundamental revision of how we measure and understand economic productivity, including metrics like GDP. The traditional wage-labor relationship that has underpinned modern ec uh, economies becomes obsolete, as does the social contract built upon the exchange of labor for wages. In other words, just because you have the right to work doesn't mean anyone's going to hire you. Uh, finally, post-labor economics uh, primarily concerns itself with two key challenges. Number one, the efficient allocation of capital in a system where capital has fully absorbed the role of labor and the economic welfare of individuals in a society where market demand for human labor has collapsed. This paradigm shift forces a reconstruction of economic models around the reality that machines can perform virtually any task, orders of magnitude more efficiently than humans, creating unprecedented deflationary pressure on both cognitive and phys physical labor markets. In other words, in uh, a post... Uh, bleh, bleh, a labor and consumption model of economic growth might simply cease to function. Now, most importantly, what I point out here is, on the surface, isn't this what we wanted all along? Fully automated luxury space communism is actively predicated on the availability of total automation. That's what AI and robotics are, the vehicles of total automation. Therefore, the inevitable disintegration of the need for human labor is, by definition, a stepping stone to fully automated luxury space communism. So... Having outlined the problem, or at least kind of what's coming, um, this uh, then allows me to define the economic agency problem or the economic agency paradox. So again, this is one of the key insights of the article, so let me just read it out, all out. The economic agency problem in post-labor economics represents a fundamental paradox where technological advancements simultaneously solves and creates existential economic crisis. While artificial intelligence and automation can theoretically solve production challenges by enabling the creation of goods and services with unprecedented efficiency, this very efficiency undermines the traditional economic me mechanisms that generate consumer demand. As human uh, labor becomes economically irrelevant due to machine superiority, the wage-labor relationship that historically uh, provided purchasing power to consumers begins to disintegrate. So by the way, wage-labor will, uh, will switch to investment direction. Um, so that's kind of the new paradigm is rather than directing your time and labor, you're directing your investments. Um, so next, this disruption reveals that the challenge lies not in the production capabilities, but in maintaining meaningful, meaningful economic participation and demand in a world where human labor holds negligible economic value. Traditional proposed solutions such as universal basic income or distributed ownership of automated systems uh, merely create artificial mechanisms for distributing purchasing power. These approaches, while potentially necessary as transitional measures, introduce economic fric friction and inefficiencies that run counter to the very produ productivity gains that automation promises. Moreover, they risk reducing humans to passive economic in uh, participants dependent on state or corporate allowances rather than maintaining genuine economic agency. This situation creates a potentially devastating feedback loop. 
And as automation increases productivity and reduces labor costs, it simultaneously erodes consumer purchasing power, which in turn diminishes the economic values of those same productivity gains. Without a clear mechanism for maintaining consumer demand that doesn't rely on artificial wealth distribution schemes, the entire economic system risks reaching an impasse where unprecedented productivity uh, capability coexists with collapsed consumer demand. This fundamental contradiction suggests that post-labor economics requires not just new distribution mechanisms, but an entirely new paradigm for understanding and structuring economic participation and value creation. Okay, so <laughs> what is economic agency? Um, I, I actually workshopped this definition of economic agency because economic agency, how you define it today, would include a lot of stuff about labor rights, my ability to form labor unions and, um, and earn uh, income based on exchanging my labor for wages. But in this future, economic agency doesn't exist in that format. So what are the criteria for economic agency in this post-labor economic future? Number one is capital access and control the ability to own, control, or benefit from automated production systems, access to the means of deploying AI and robots, control over rights to the output of automated systems. So again, if capital subsumes labor, then in order to participate in the economy of the future, you need to own some of that capital because there's not going to be any labor. Next, resource allocation rights. The ability to make decisions about how automated resources are used. This is that decentralized social brain um, that really, really... Uh, pleases the Austrian economists out there. Because rather than the government saying, we're going to manage everything with AI and just give you uh, an allowance, this says, no, actually, let's allow individuals to find uh, opportunities. Um, so resource allocation rights, the ability to make decisions about how automated resources are used, rights to claim or direct the distribution of goods and services produced by automated systems, access to basic necessities and luxuries in a world where human labor isn't a uh, prerequisite. The primary service here is going to be healthcare, because again, if healthcare becomes a thousand times or two thousand times cheaper because of AI, then healthcare will basically be too cheap to meter. At that point, you just subsidize whoever's providing health care and the government just writes them a check. And even if they do price gouging, who cares? Um, because in that case, health care becomes uh, a basic service that you can just go get anywhere. You can probably have your own home health droid in that future. Um, you can have your own full-time doctor. Um, okay, so next is, uh, uh, and finally, system participation mechanisms. Ways to meaningfully participate in economic decision-making without being a labor contributor, methods to express preferences and influence production and distribution, and means to initiate new economic activities or ventures even when human labor isn't the primary input. So basically, this would be the right to create a new crypto coin. This would be the right to create a new decentralized autonomous organization, um, and so on and so forth. And this is why I talked about how um, uh, legal framework modernization is required, because right now, if you were to try and set up a DAO and actually do real business, they would say, well, are you actually a company or are you a securities exchange? And the SEC might sue you into oblivion. Um, and that's just, that's just not going to work um, <laughs> in the long run. So then tokenomics becomes uh, the way of the future. Um, what I wanted to rest on here is this graph that um, came out a, a while ago. This is by Anton Kornack over at um, the, uh, I think IMF is what he, the, the International Monetary Fund is where this was posted. This is the economic agency paradox in a graph form. So on the left side, you have output. So productivity skyrockets. Under AGI, productivity goes hyperbolic. However, also under AGI, wages trend to zero. So this is the paradox, is while productivity goes up, wages go down, therefore the entire uh, jig is up, nothing works, the entire economy grinds to a halt, unless people have a way of participating. This is the economic agency paradox visualized. So that's very, very important. Um, I'll make sure that there's a link to this um, in the description. So then I, um, in the rest of the article, I unpack a couple of protestations, um, which are actually, you know, just like kind of criticisms and stuff, but intelligence too cheap to meter. This is where that comes from. Sam Altman. So thank you for that term, Sam Altman. Um, and let's see. Yeah. So then I just restate everything in, in greater detail, better, faster, cheaper, safer. Um, so this is, this is the A plus B equals C. So better, faster, cheaper, safer, plus economic agency paradox. Therefore, we need something else to shore up consumer demand, which is an investment-based economy. Um, and then I further unpack the principles for building this economy in greater detail. And that is that. This is an extension of, not a replacement of, my post-labor economics manifesto. 
Um, so there you have it. You are now up to speed on how we're going to build the economy of the future as best as I can tell. And by the way, I have started socializing this with real living, breathing economists with PhDs, and many of them say, this is good stuff. They have some criticisms and complaints, um, but I didn't come up with this in a vacuum is what I'm saying, is that I actually talked to real economists and other people who study this on a technology side um, in order to shape and workshop this. So this is not just my idea. Um, but I'm the one putting it together. I'm assembling the building blocks. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.